here. And, and Lauren is so impressive and has done so much great work in this area. And, and let's talk about your personal experience, Lauren. I know you grew up in Florida. Your dad is a lawyer and a lobbyist, so he traveled a lot, was often gone for three or four months altogether a the year. The legislative session, right? yes. And, and your, your mom uh, had some emotional issues. Which precluded her from really being able to engage with me, my sister, and my brother. It made it really difficult. So we always had nannies coming in and out of our and 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 there was a nanny uh, who was hired when you were 10 years old. Yeah. Tell us what happened. Well, um, one of the things when you have um, a father who travels a lot and a mother who's really not available, um, one of the things that happens is you have to become a parent, not only to your parent, but to your siblings. And so being the oldest, I loved being able to take care of my sister and my brother, make sure homework was done, dinner was eaten. Um, but there was one problem at 10, I couldn't drive and I couldn't get us to school. Um, so we had to hire nannies and we had nannies in and out and um, one year before um, I turned 11 years old Waldina came into our home her name was Waldina Flores in August and didn't really like her didn't really want her there I enjoyed caring for my siblings and um, eventually she really started to work very hard to build a trusting relationship with me my sister my brother and my parents um, I got to stay up late and get extra dessert I didn't have to call shotgun which at 10 years old with two other siblings is a pretty big deal um, well, was she especially nice to you yes and she began that grooming process very early on um, December sorry grooming which no 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 that's okay yeah. I just thought we should explain what grooming is that's when a, a an abuser kind of sets his or her victim up, right? Absolutely. It kind of starts manipulating them. Yes, they build that trusting relationship again, not just with the target child, but with the family. My dad didn't think I had to worry about being Waldy being around the kids. He trusted her implicitly. And so in December, uh, we were working at my mom's chocolate store, and I was chewing my gum like a cow. And she said, stop chewing your gum that way. And being the 10-year-old sassy girl that I was at the time, I said, well, what are you going to do about it? And she proceeded to stick her tongue in my mouth and take the gum out of my mouth with her tongue. Ugh. And when I didn't run and tell a grown-up buddy, when I didn't tell a parent, a trusted adult, she knew that she had me hook, line, and sinker. And from that time on, for six, six years, I was physically abused, um, sexually abused, and emotionally abused every day. And, and, and let me ask you what I asked Jamie. You felt, did you feel trapped by the situation and describe that? There was no way. I felt there was no way out. Partly because I didn't tell in the beginning. I thought my dad would think that I was dirty, that I wanted it, that I was a lesbian. It was my first sexual encounter with a woman. Um, so I felt like I, this was what I had to deal with. This is kind of what was. And she threatened you. What would she say to keep you from talking? Well, in, in my case, she told me that she would leave and that she would get in trouble. And when you come from a really dysfunctional family, as I did, having her there and having her protect me from some of the other things that were going on in my home was an okay trade. What's very interesting is your parents did notice that you had become increasingly isolated, that you didn't have many friends, yep. and they sent, not knowing, they sent her to talk to you about it. Yeah. And she actually got your yearbook, found a boy, and decided this boy was going to be your boyfriend. Yep. Luckily, he was the reason you finally came forward. He knew, he noticed some things that were going on um, in, interpersonally when we were relating. He saw some of those bruises that other people didn't see, um, and he started asking questions. And he said, I'm going to keep on asking until, until I get you the help that you need because I know something's going on. And um, one day, Waldina called him and threatened him, and he got very afraid, and he said, either you're going to tell your father today or I'm going to tell him tomorrow. Please don't make me tell your father. And um, so I went and I told a therapist what had happened. And um, we began that, that entire process of going through court. And Waldina fled to Oklahoma, where she was found coaching 10-year-old girls in soccer. Um, she was eventually brought back, and, and we proceeded with, with, with court. And, and, yeah, and what happened to her? She was sentenced to she what? Sent 15 years and then an additional 10 years um, when she started contacting me, which wasn't against the law at the time from prison. I know your dad, Ron, is here. And, and Ron, I'm just curious, you know, when, when you heard that this had been happening over a period of years, it must have been so shocking to, to you. Well, it was pretty outrageous. Um, I got a phone call from the therapist 
the day before I actually found out the story, and I was typical day getting on another airplane to another place. I was about halfway up the steps, and the phone rings, and the therapist says to me, um, he needs to meet with me, he needs to talk with me. And I said, well, what is it about? Well, obviously, it's about Lauren. So, well, what's it about? He said, I can't tell you on the phone. I, you know, come in and see me. I said, well, do I need to get off the plane and do that? I'm on my way to, to Tampa. He said, no, be here at 7 in the morning. I said, well, what's it about? He said, I can't tell you. I said, well, I'm the parent here. you got to tell me. Now, I had a daughter who was a straight-A student and never really did anything wrong. But as a concerned parent, at that time, is she doing drugs? No. Is she drinking? No. Is she pregnant? No. Is she dropping out of school? No. Well, what could it possibly be? Far be it for me to ever even remotely think that it could have been an abusive situation the next morning at 7 in the morning. Uh, the two of us went separately, but at the same time to the therapist, Lauren sat out in the reception area, and I went in, and he explained to me, and our recitation of, of what happened uh, during that time, Lauren's recitation is that, and recollection is that I was sobbing and unhappy. Mine was a full shock and dismay, and you just got to do the things you need to do. At no time did we ever remotely think that we shouldn't report, never did we think that we shouldn't prosecute, never did we think we shouldn't track her down and, and bring justice to the situation, um, which unfortunately doesn't always happen uh, here and around the world. Jamie Howard is a clinical psychologist. She specializes in, in trauma. And, you know, I, I know these abusers are incredibly adept mm -hmm. at, as, as Lauren called, grooming, but ingratiating themselves with parents and with even youth-oriented organizations, right? So they have access to their victims. Absolutely, and they develop a trusting relationship with the survivors of sexual abuse, and they, they do their best to sort of seek out vulnerable children, children who maybe have a lack of parental involvement, not due to any fault of the parent, but because they're working very hard, like Jamie's mother was. And also, they might look for sort of sensitive children or children who are prone to experiencing shame or guilt, because that's how they can keep them quiet, and the abuse can go on and on. You've done so much work as a result of your personal experience experiences. Tell us about Lauren's Kids and some of the work you've done with legislation in the state of Florida. Well, um, Lauren's Kids does two things. We work to prevent sexual abuse and heal survivors of sexual abuse through education. 95% of sexual abuse is preventable with education and awareness. And so we have our Safer Smarter Kids curriculum in over 16,000 classrooms throughout the state of Florida. Um, we're gearing up for our 1,500 mile walk from Key West to Tallahassee um, during Sexual Assault Awareness Month, March and April. Um, um, and the legislative piece of what we do, the advocacy piece of what we do is so big. Um, one of the things that we were able to work with our legislator to do is eliminate completely the statute of limitations in the state of Florida, both criminally and civilly. We've been able to make Florida the only truly mandatory reporting state in this country that everyone, it matters not if you're a teacher, a neighbor, it's your, your duty to report suspected child abuse. If you suspect it, you must report it. It's crazy that more isn't done on a national level to educate kids and their parents. I think we should have you all back for a whole, a, a, another show to talk about the warning signs for kids and what parents need to do to have the kind of relationship that their kids feel safe and confiding with them because they're fighting so much of that shame and guilt and pressure that's placed on them by the abuser. It, it, it's, it's tremendous because there are so many different dynamics going on in place and it's such a confusing difficult time. And you're a kid. I mean you're a kid dealing with adolescence and dealing with childhood so I just want to say I really admire both you and Jamie mm -hmm. for talking about this publicly and hopefully people can use this as a springboard to talk to their own children about this issue and to understand the warning signs and what they need to be on the lookout for and how they need to respond if their children do in fact confide in them. Thank you. Lauren believe Book. Them. Yeah, believe them. Absolutely. Yeah. Lauren Book, thank you. And Ron Book, thank you as well. And Jamie again. And Dr. Howard, thanks to you as well. We'll be back right after this.